this week in Boston is at Berkeley College of Music and also at the New School in Cambridge we had the Lenny Tristano Centennial which was a hundredth year celebration of his birth. We have uh, lectures and concerts and it's a real great and I think to me meaningful validation of everything he was doing. I'd like to introduce the venerable Harvey Diamond. Harvey was a fellow student of mine with Lenny Tristano way back in the day and we thought we'd like to share some stories of Lenny and reminiscences, maybe a little bit about his piano teaching. Uh, for those of you that don't, don't know, Lenny was one of the great jazz pianists of all time and he lived from 1919 until 1978 and had a very active teaching studio in Hollis, Queens. Because the great thing about Lenny, again, is he had this real curriculum for piano. And although he wouldn't follow it exactly with everybody, he was taking into account the total musician. And he wanted to create a musician that had a strong foundation of technique and ear training and theory. He wanted to give you the whole package. So you couldn't leave from a lesson without having specific exercises. He walked into his studio. He was sitting usually on like a kind of a, what would you call it, like a recliner kind of a thing? Uh, I think so. I remember that's what it was like. Like a sofa yeah. recliner yeah. thing? Kind of at the end of the room. He had a Baldwin piano in his teaching studio. And he had basically... Uh, two different types of things, maybe three, that he would do as a lesson. One of the things about Lenny that was so fantastic and why he was such a successful teacher is that he was one of the first people that came up with the pedagogy for teaching jazz. And he, of course, he worked with each person separately and differently because everyone's an individual. Exactly right. But he did have an approach to teaching where he gave the student subjects to learn. So it was not at all random. There was basically technique to do. There was voicing, some kind of theory. Absolutely. Playing on tunes, improvising, Scaling. arranging uh, chords yes. in the left hand. Yes. And then always you couldn't leave without singing a record. Right. I always felt like, look, he was out to help you play and get out whatever music was inside you as an individual, Absolutely. even though there was specific stuff to work on. So the pedagogy was you would learn the, the, the pieces of the puzzle and then you got a chance to put the puzzle together in the way that you wanted. Exactly right. It was like covering everything that goes into playing right. without saying what to play and how to do it. Right, and that was amazing. Which is beautiful because that brings out right. one's own individuality in their play, which I would say that's what jazz is about. Sure. In, in six, seven, let's see, eight years, seven years of studying with him, he never told me to pl what note to play. Beautiful man. I, I could read. Right. He years. never talked about chord scales. Or never. Never. Nothing. Never. And that never was just unusual. It worked somehow. I don't know how. Yeah. No, never would. But that. somehow you didn't need Absol it. Absolutely. So we have the technique. We have the theory. We have the ear training. Then when she got into improvising, that was a whole nother trip. First thing were the scales with different combinations of fingers. Right. And even though I had, all, I had already, I've been playing the piano since I'm five years old. Right. Uh, so, uh, but I was knocked out with it all. So the first thing was doing scales with different combinations of fingers. One, two. Right. One, two. Four, five. Four, five. So this means that you had to play a scale. Were you doing contrary motion? I first started out each hand alone. Each hand alone. Alone and slow. Oh baby, slow. With the metronome. With the metronome. Slow. That's a controversial subject right there. Right. But Lenny was 
definitely into using the metronome. Yes. Not as a crutch, but as a device to strengthen your tongue. Exactly right. And so one, two, four, one, five. One, two, four, five. One, two, three. One, two, three. Three, four, five. Three, four, five. One, two, one, two, three. Perfect. Three, four, five, four, five. Exactly. And then the fingering you normally learn when you go study the piano. And the classical, classical, classical piano, regular classical fingering. And so, Harvey, you start off with one hand. He started okay, off yeah, contrary. Yeah. And left hand down. Left hand down. Down. Right. Right. And back. And then... With one, two, out, back. Right. Four, five, just out. Right. One, two, three, out, back. Right. Three, four, five, just out. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three, out, back. Three, four, five, four, five. Beautiful. Just out. Exactly. Classic fingering. Out. And then that was just uh, he would that would be in straight time, you know, equal time. Then he yeah, put yeah, you absolutely. through that, that, the that timings. Was, I think the important thing too. I think one thing he mentioned was to make sure that you bottom out the note. Ah, that now tell, get, tell me about this. No, right, this was. Just, I mean, you could you can't go further than when the note goes down because right. you start to hurt your arm. But to get to the bottom. Of ah, the note. see, I never heard this from you. It was called bottoming out the note. Bottoming yeah, out the note. Yeah, making sure you got to the bottom of each note. Now, did he want you to do that with every note you played? Every note you played, man. Wow. Yeah, with with the scale, getting to the bottom. Of the other thing was when you were playing on the white notes. Because when you're playing the white notes, you can take it towards the outside of the key. Right. So that you take it as close to the black keys as possible. Right. Because when you're improvising, so you have all those notes under your fingers, because improvising is going by in a split second, that just the time, for, if you're on the outside of the white note, going to a black note, you might get hung up. Beautiful. So you'd be in as close to the black notes as possible. And the other great thing about that is that I discovered in doing this was when you got into chords, being right in there, man, in between in, the in black between notes, the black keys. Yeah, being inside there gave you a different feeling and a different contact with your fingers in, in some way. I, I felt a lot like what he was doing with the fingering was was breaking the traditional classical fingering. Oh, totally. So well, because you could be with four, five. Right, the four, I mean, you just playing like this. classical fingering. It goes like this, four, five, four, five, and slow. Slow. But, slow. Well, the thing is with classical fingering, you're strong on your fifth finger and never on a black note. Right. So he was trying to. Right, That's he was trying to break get the on the other, and the pinky thing. Get on the other side of that, but right. also I think you could say he was trying to get you so that uh, getting loose enough so you could play with any hand, with any finger, whatever that you heard. So I did exactly the same exercise that Harvey did. We start off with the one, two, four, five. Right. We have we went up uh, a contrary motion. Contrary motion. And right. then it was you change the timing. So you, instead of just going bum beam bum beam bum two beam, against one, two against three one, three against one, three against four one, against one, four against one, three against two, three. Then you get into three against two. So you're doing this four and five fingering. Maybe you're playing an A flat a harmonic minor, right. and the right hand's going in three, and the left hand's going in two or four or five, right. and you had to keep it all together with two fingers and do it at like forty on the metronome. Exactly. And right. we did this for years. That's right. And the the, the exercise that he gave me was five years long. Uh, I, I, somebody who was studying with me said he figured out that. Wherever this is at, he, he figured it out that he went through the scale every week. Right. Everything that you were supposed to do would take eight years. Eight years, okay. Yeah, he, he just came back and said eight years. Yes. It's like like we were talking about yeah. the chord voices, the yes. standard ones. So I finished five years, right? So for okay. my for me, it was a five year program. Okay. And I mean, this was every day. We were kids. I'm 16, 17. You know, that's that's how old we were. And and you'd be sitting in your attic or in your basement <laughs> and playing the piano with two fingers and going in timings and you do this for years, five years. So finally I go to his house and it's like, we're done. Because I knew where it was done. Right. And so I said, man, we're done. 
wow, you know, thank God. And he goes, no way. <laughs> now we're going to do it all again <laughs> without the metronome. <laughs> and that was the only time I ever said no to him. Right. I said, right. I'm not going to do that, man. That's Come on, good. please. Yeah. And he laughed his ass that, off. That's, that's great. He laughed. His sense of humor <laughs> was uh, spectacular. That is too, that's too funny. Well, obviously, the sound that you were getting from each note was important. Mm -hmm. Nice, even sound. Even so. Yeah, you know. So the so the, the the task to a certain degree was to get an even sound from uneven fingers. Well, I, he told me once that when he first heard Bud Powell play mm. live, that it helped him realize in his own teaching that you could express a feeling mm. with your fingers. Right. Which, when you really think about that, whoever thinks about that, I, I never heard that. I mean, that was like, I, uh, that was probably the most common word in his vocabulary when he was teaching was feeling, feeling right? Right. And, and, and a lot of people call him cold and unemotional, hands. but that wasn't it at all. Well, the, the, the first thing inevitably he would give most piano players were these lists of chord voicings. And this is for the left hand. Possibilities, right? right. The left hand. So he, he had an ingenious way of doing it where he had he, he had you study the possibilities for a certain family of chords. And it chords. was really organized. Really organized. So yeah. major sevenths, and he gave, there were at least 20 or 30. He would have you play lists of chords, one, three, seven, and he would call them out from across the room. One, three, seven. One, three, <laughs> five, seven. <laughs> and, and you would do this in every key, and you right. just listen to it, right? Right. And then it would be two, three, five, and there was exactly. a long list of them. There's many more than I'm saying. Three, you know, two, three, five, one. I mean, it really was like every possibility. Right. And for the dominant, so you would study one family of uh, chords, major seventh, let's say. Right. And Miami. you might take weeks going yeah, yeah, through all yeah. the keys. Minor right? seven, flat five. Yeah. Tonic, minor chord. The dominant, dominant list, two million of them. There were over a hundred. Yeah. One whole entire lesson of 30 minutes was him calling out numbers of dominant seventh chords. Yeah, there was there were loads of them. Like it was over a hundred, and every had to do them in every, every key, key. And in major, Man. melodic, minor, oh. jazz minor, and harp. <laughs> it was wow. unbelievable. Well, no, that was the diatonic. I, I yeah. take that back. Right. This, this was just the category. Right. So the chord list, yeah. he had you do like major sevens, and he had a list of those. Right. Minor, major seven, minor six, so, yeah, minor major seven. Major seven, minor seven, minor seven, five, minor seven, five, five, five. Tonic minor chords, minor, okay. which are minor majors. Minor majors. And then dominant sevens. Dominance. Yeah, dominance. Yeah, and, and these were lists of possibilities. And, and, uh, and then you'd find your own. Right. And then as soon as he would finish giving you these lists of possibilities, he, you would start arranging. And that was a beautiful way to do it because he gave you all these possibilities. It's like you were Monet in the lilies and you had your palette of colors. And he gave you the palette of colors with just trillions of them. And then you choose which ones to use. Exactly. And you make arrangements. And I remember the thing that he wanted us to do most of the time. Keep the thumb, on top. Keep the thumb like within a Well, step it felt or... like you could get something melodic yes. right within the chord voice. Right. Just to have that awareness. Right. So he called it a, like a, having a counter line in the thumb of the left hand. Exactly right. right. And so you'd have the two melodies and if you hear on his recordings, it's very clear that he's doing this. Yep. And he has this real slow moving, usually melody in the left thumb. And that was set intentionally against the faster moving line. And it was, it was beautiful. The thumb was on top of those chords. And the other thing I, I recall at least was making sure that you, uh, you could arpeggiate obviously the ones that were hard to reach. Right. But once that morning, he wanted to make sure that he struck all the notes together. All the notes together. Now, I did just, he say to you something like, 
like the, something like this? Like you wanted to go like land on the yeah, course? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing and that I had never heard before because I had studied with someone in San Francisco was really good. Physical relaxation. Physical relaxation. Yeah, that getting loose as possible. And if you get to that with that kind of work, then it's just like you transfer it over into your brain. If you get what that looseness feels like, right. you can't force it. Right. But if you can keep the feeling in the back of your brain, then you can perhaps bring it through when you play. Right. Now, I remember a lesson also where he was... He went through the whole thing, how to sit, right? Yeah, oh yeah, like that, my very like first kid. lesson was how to sit. And he had sit. a whole thing, right? He, and, right, right. And he would kind of like, he would, he would at times, when he was describing the physical posture, he would came over to me and kind of like, kind of oh, like no. got on top of me, you know? He, and he, just kind of showed out, me how to do it. the hell out of me on my back. Yeah, yeah. No, no, because you were supposed to sit up, which of course I don't do now at right. all. But back then, I remember being bent over yes. doing it, man, and he came over to me and he went, Oh, wow, beautiful. Right in the middle of my back. Oh, that's I've great. I always remember that, man. He wow. made his way over and did that. So we have, the, we have the technique. That was one aspect of what he taught us with the scales. Yeah, okay. Scales. And we had the theory with the chords, chords, with the formations and the voicings, and then he got into two hand chords, right? Right, got into diatonic, doing the chords right. diatonically, starting with triads, right. major, melodic minor, harmonic minor. Right. From there, seventh chords all closed position, major right. in the minor. Right. Then we got to open position with two handed chords through uh, sevenths, ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths. Right. And then we'd start to put those together with tunes. Right. So he, ha he gave you the material first, for example, one hand chords, and then he had you use the materials you had studied to create something. Exactly. Right. And you then he do. would go on to the next level of materials, give you that, and then you would create something with that. And he would give me exercises where I had to improvise with one finger. You got it. You did those? Yeah. Did you? I went through the whole hand. Yeah. Thumb. Yeah. Second finger. Third yeah. Finger. You have to and improvise a whole, whole piece hand. like this, and then he would go to the left hand, and you'd have to improvise a whole. Finally, you'd be improvising on pennies from heaven at about forty on the metronome with only the pinky. Yeah. Right. That's so cool. Oh man, and we did this for years. Yeah. So when you were improvising, he, he had uh, uh, his own way of speeding. So a lot of, uh, as you got further into the playing, it was about being able to do what you could do faster. That was one aspect. So the metronome really was important there. So he had me going from the bottom of the metronome. Top, you right. play, and even if you're using all your fingers, bottom of the metronome, one chorus at 40, one chorus at 42, one chorus at yeah, 44, right. each, each, all the way up yeah. to 208. Exactly, and back. And then back. Exactly. Beautiful, man. Man. Right out. Back. Jesus. <laughs> so you have the complete pedagogy, and that's, I think, I, I think that's one of his greatest legacies among the tremendous list of accomplishments that he, that he made in his life. I agree with you. And, uh, and the last thing was the singing with records, right? You couldn't right. leave without singing, singing with records. Besides the idea that you could express a feeling with your fingers, he did tell me this, that he felt like uh, when he heard Bud Powell live, that it helped him realize in his own teaching uh, the sound that you get from the piano. And it changed one aspect of how you did the scales. And he also told me that this, he felt, was the greatest thing that he had ever put together out of everything that he put together. And what that was, was that you kept your, and I'll show you on the piano in a second. Sure. That you kept your uh, arm and your wrist totally still. Still. And you just did it with your fingers. So say you're doing C major with one, two, and your hand was a little bit above the keyboard. Okay. 
Ajá. Que tú eres, Javi. Aquí es bien, sí. Que es oído. So you're hitting it with the finger. Just, yeah, this is not moving. Now, did he want you to play that way all the time? No, but he told me, and uh, this has happened to me too, is that as time went on, uh, he, he was playing more flat fingers. He was playing more flat fingers. Yeah, but not necessarily that way. Yeah, yeah. But, but this, so this was, say, you, oh, I got something else with the scales too. So this. E, got to do it slow because you got to make sure you're raising each finger. Now, this was a, a specific exercise? That Absolutely. Had? Okay, I didn't uh, get With this. all the scales. Yeah, same way, okay. all the fingerings. Okay. So, three to the finger. Wow. <laughs> Fourth finger. Unbelievable. Five. And that's how yeah. we did it. So, you're just using your fingers. Wow. Nothing else. Your arm's not happening. Right. So, uh, did we talk about also the articulations in the scales? So, you start out, so now we're going to use our whole hand. Uh, so, you first start articulating two notes. So, you're preparing the next two with your mind. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. When you get to the note you're going to, be cool. I didn't do this, yeah. Prepare the next two. Prepare the next two. Uh-huh. And, and so, so, this is an exercise in group of two. That's right. And then we worked all the way through doing that with all seven notes. We did two. So you did groups of three. Each hand alone. Then groups of four. Like. First note, you just strike. Ah. Amazing. And we did that through seven notes, left hand down and back. Oh, amazing. Same thing. So that would kind of get you thinking more phrasing and more... More kind of phrasing, more, I, I like think get you... A flow of notes. Extending the line. Beautiful. I mean, the idea, right, for him was to get it to the point where our fingers wouldn't hang us up or get in the right. way, get loose enough, right. so we could better play whatever it is that we heard. But the Bud Powell thing on, yeah, and we did the same mind. thing, what I just did, uh, two, three, four, five, six, right. and we did that the same way. Two notes. Three notes, just your fingers. Make your fingers feel unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right. And also gets to your sound. Right. Gets to your sound right. if you do it enough. So we did that with all the scale fingers. Right. A lot of times people ask in, uh, in jazz, if you want to study jazz piano or be a jazz pianist, do you have to play classical music? Oh, beautiful. Now, uh, he said no, exactly. yeah. Now his his feeling was, you didn't have to play classical music to get the technical facility, but you did have to study technique. Yes, you had to work on the mechanism, but it didn't have to be through classical. But I, I also think he felt like there was no. Sub I can remember when I was doing some teaching at a college, uh, the technical aspect and the pieces were always separate. People would say, "I have to go practice my technique." Or they say, now I have to go practice Brahms or yeah. Chopin. Yeah. But I think in playing jazz, it's all one. It's all one. We're talking about the chord voicings mm -hmm. and putting them together with melodies. Mm -hmm. Whereas you came up with different notes that you think when go together started to sound right. After uh -huh. you play them enough. And you had the freedom to to go where you, you're told you exactly where, where you, you want to go. And that would inf influence what you played on top of it. Right. That would open that up for you. Right. Uh, and so we invite you to listen to Lenny's music, contact either of us if you want, and thank you for tuning in. Blessings and keep swinging. Yeah, from Boston. <laughs>